name is Killian Kelly, I'm a BIM lead at CISC and I'll just give you a small kind of company introduction um, for anyone that doesn't know about CISC. So uh, established in 1959, one of the largest construction companies in Ireland and the UK, fifth generation family business, marked for leading contract over 50, for over 50 years, reputation of leading um, large projects um, and working with industry leading clients, strong culture of safety and delivering quality over 30 years in the UK market, annual 1 billion turnover. And uh, so last year we went through our BRE, uh, BIM Level 2 Business System Certification. We have been the first main contractor in Ireland to achieve the BRE BIM Level 2 System Certification. So experience of BIM, uh, UCD Science Centre would have been one of the first projects that CISC actually um, introduced a BIM process um, that they would have taken a 2D design and developed into 3D. Since then there's a number of different projects. We thought the CERC would have been a good, was a good project to um, demonstrate a BIM Level 2 process uh, from design right through to operation. So currently uh, working in Grange Gas and Multinational Data Centre, um, APAN Upper Key, which we have the client in the room, Arthur Cox uh, Office Development, we've recently handed over, Aragon Biologics 2, which is a pharmaceutical plant in the west of Ireland, um, and now more recently we're in the design stage of DIT Grange Gorm, uh, Dublin. So on the CERC, the BIM requirements, and so Donald would have touched on this. So we had um, design and construction information to BIM level 2, uh, reduce on-site changes, early, early identification of issues, improve construction teams, project understanding, improve site coordination, improve planning, uh, and work sequencing, provide data rich as built model, and provide um, our project information managers to identify who's going to actually lead um, BIM on the project, and construction stage BIM execution plan. And essentially this would be all hosted on a common data environment. So I've structured the presentation around the BIM Level 2 process and what's required of a main contract when following the workflow on PAS Level 2 to your documentation. So people might be familiar with these graphs throughout the presentation which is it's ex explaining a BIM Level 2 process and what's required. So the documentation that was issued to us, uh, we had an EIR employer's information requirement. We were issued an MWD which is your federated model. We had a BIM protocol put in place, a model sharing agreement, a COBE matrix, which was the asset information requirements on the project, um, and a BIM integrated safety file. So we had to actually produce a digital safety file that we had a three model integrated with that. And as Donald mentioned, there was a presentation delivered to all the main contractors bidding on the project at the time. And that's where we could actually ask the questions if, we were any, if there was any area that we were unsure about. We could ask the client. Uh, design team of what we, were you expecting in terms of your digital safety file and those questions were asked. So the tender response, um, we had a pre-construction BIM execution plan, so we outlined the resources, software and uh, the milestones on the project. Um, we also had BIM assessment forms of the main contractor and this was again uh, something that we introduced to the supply chain um, and then we identified the project information manager. So during the um, tender stage, I would have took the role of the project information manager, but then during construction, we appointed a BIM engineer, so Andy Garrett is going to speak on behalf of the subcontractor um, following this. So the next stage of the process was the contract award, so the post-contract BIM execution plan. So this is where you identify how you're going to actually um, run the project in terms of BIM, what's the BIM requirements. We looked at the model production delivery table, identified what the level of detail was in the model that, that was issued to us, where the gaps were, where we filled those gaps. Um, the information requirement for the digital OM safety files, so we were putting Zootech forward at the platform for the digital safety file where we'd integrate the 3D model and your digital safety file. Um, we identified that we'd be introducing classification and code before all the maintainable assets. Um, and again, the BIM assessment form would have been carried out across our supply chain, and we bridged that gap with the BIM engineer developing. Um, the BIM packages of the subcontractors that didn't have the BIM capabilities. Um, and again, the model production delivery table, we went through that with the client, identifying areas that might not have, um, there might have been a BIM model provided in some cases. So viewpoint for projects um, was a construction stage, common data environment. So part of the project setup, we had to agree to folder structure, set up security groups, so who, who had access to what information at what stage, uh, set up notifications, so we'd have a weekly upload of a model that we would be notified of the supply chain uploading their models and agreed workflows so that would have been workflows behind the information so there was an approval process that you had to check, review and approve and publish, publish of information. So we set up workflows behind the information being uploaded to four projects 
um, and then single source project information so that there would only be ever one version of a document or model um, on the four projects and that we agreed the name and structure at the start of the project that um, we didn't put the revision or the status on the name that it was, this was metadata within four projects. So the construction stage and then um, so the model breakdown. So essentially we would have been issued four models at, um, design, from, from the design and test models. So we did the architectural model from Cody Architecture uh, and a landscape model produced from Cody Architecture as well, structural model from MRG and uh, an MEP model for JV Thermic. So part of our uh, scope, once we received those design and test models, we had to then break those models down into packages that we would issue that to our subcontractors. Um, so the subcontractors with BIM kit release would produce um, and would procure the design team's uh, model and remo remove all the packages that weren't required for their, their scope. And then work packages of uh, contractors without BIM capabilities were updated in the models by CISC. So this isn't um, something that we would um, promote going forward, but in terms of where the industry was at, the supply chain to meet the demand of the tenant requirements, we actually um, developed the subcontractor's information along with their technical submittals. So as they issued their technical submittals, we would develop a 3D model so we'd have that coordinated as part of um, the requirements of the project. And some packages were split into their own uh, separate models um, for the coordination process. For instance, the raised access floor, um, there wasn't a raised access floor model, but we developed that package along with the subcontractor and uh, during the coordination meetings, we sat with the design team to get this proposal from the, from the um, the subcontractor around the raised access floor and we were fit to go through that in 3D in the coordination meetings with the design team along with the information that was produced from our subcontractor. Um, going forward we'd hope that the supply chain, um, I suppose we we're bringing the supply chain with us in terms of the BIM requirements on projects. Um, so really the next stage is the subcontractor and we'll have Enda Gary speaking on behalf of Dominic O'Connor and the process around that and then I'll speak about uh, another small bit of okay. it. Um, so, Don mentioned at the start, we had to do with those 40 requirements. Um, so, we used Synchro, would have been the platform we actually used um, to introduce the 40 construction sequence. So, this is made up of your ASTA program, um, your 3D model, your construction methodology, and then you essentially link this through Synchro. So, this would have been part of what we produced for the tender requirements. Um, as you can see, there's many different benefits <coughs> from this maintainer life building during operations, integrating. Uh, with staff and the public better understanding, clear communication with the project team, safety awareness, public awareness. So this, this would have been shown, we updated this throughout construction, but this would have been shown during safety inductions. And it's a standard across any BIM project we're uh, involved in now that we have um, a 40 construction sequence showing your site logistics, your construction methodology, how you're going to go about building it. But um, this is done from a BIM engineer, it's the whole project team saying this is where I want to hold and this is where I want to lay down areas, this is where I want the traffic coming in. Um, pedestrian routes and so you have a full um, project team working with you making those decisions. As I said we had planned and actual so this is just sped up but um, for the plan you can see actually it's the actual and plan the way it's uh, oriented so this is the actual and the stairs we went up first and then that's what we actually um, built it to. So you can see the benefits from this and then how we actually communicate this so we ensure the correct professionals are making the decisions so the contract manager, senior engineer and they were making the decisions around how the building was going to be built and, and then again showing the file name this is essential on a project that you maintain your file name if we start changing the file name of your program or your documentation or your 3D model you lose the link between um, your 4D model so then we agreed to dates and um, draft review dates, deadlines, uh, agreed communications and meetings, uh, live review meetings and single source for managing the 4D information so essentially um, this was managed from one person on site and um, that the planner would issue an updated program and we'd have an updated <coughs> model on an ongoing basis. Another uh, point that we would have actually producing at on site, uh, we had um, 11 equipment services were um, a partner on it that we were actually using the Leica icon for actually setting out the, um, the RC frame. So we actually export, or there was a rivet plugin that we used uh, to export the structural model. We hid the elements that we didn't need. And then the engineers out on site were setting out using the model so they could offset from the model and have all the information, all the points there and then so they didn't have to come up and um, back up to the compounds on an ongoing basis to have all the information there. Kobe again was a, a, a requirement um, as part of the tender documentation. So the way we actually managed this, we had a Kobe extension 
um, which is a river plugin, and uh, during the construction stage, each uh, task team populated information within the model. So the subcontractors we were getting them to update the information um, on the model, and this was really done for the maintainable assets in terms of, um, again, with the classification. So we agreed which classification we were going with, and this was the um, for all the maintainable assets. So if the for the future build on the project that we can then uh, have all the maintainable assets in the building uh, with Kobe information in it. And um, next is just around the handover and closeout. So we'll be leading on into uh, Zootech around Brendan Railton. So we're just talking about this is the next stage then of the um, digital link to the di digital safety file link to BIM. And uh, on this stage, so Zootech was provided on platform uh, we acquired for the HSC facilities management. So now the HSC has acquired uh, Zootech for um, an annual basis. And uh, so that's the platform they're actually using to view the model, to view the documentation. Um, all the design teams must supply Zootech with, um, with element schedules. And then a global unique identifier was the, um, the actual code that connected the documentation to the 3D model. Um, so this can be extracted from IFC, a ribbit file uh, from Zootech. And then the subcontractors, again, we uh, had the, sub the subcontractors would have loaded their information onto Zootech, and then Zootech actually linked the 3D model and your documentation. Um, and so this was a process where we had to actually have the ASBIT model. So an IFC model was the ASBIT model. So we had a number of different models that would have been loaded onto Zootech. And at the end of the project, we had the final ASBIT model uh, was the model that they actually uh, made the links would have kept the um, unique or global unique identifier uh, maintained throughout the project you maintain those links. Um, another just uh, point that we were actually carrying out on site, so we had a barcode system on site for each one of the rooms on site um, that we had barcodes put in place that we'd scan the barcode um, using the Zootech um, on-site app and this actually pre-populated the information within each room and we were fit to um, record our snags on site. Um, so the next phase is really the operation and in use, and uh, so I'll briefly just around the, uh, as again, we were using Zootex, so we used to capture, review and approve uh, all operational maintenance manuals, as well as drawings, warranties, asset registers and um, spares, and now I'll lead you on to Brandon O'Reilly and he talk around Zootex and the process around that. <laughs> We had to present to the HSC Estates in December and uh, so the seat of Pairs would have been the project manager and uh, poor feedback really would have um, from the project. It was uh, you know, a learning lesson for the, for the project team, for the client, everyone involved in it and uh, it's just a short note from Zeta but essentially we presented at the HSC Estates and um, the message she was delivering was that this is um, something that we sh uh, they want to introduce going forward that um, they're keen on a BIM process being introduced at the tender requirements, that they want the main contractor engaging, and uh, that's really to get the asset information requirements at an early stage of the project, and how they're going to manage their assets going forward. Um, you know, a BIM process is how Zeta was, um, I suppose, promoting the idea of a BIM level two process, and she realized the efficiencies around it. Um, so Joe Orr, the estate's uh, manager, uh, would have been also closely involved in the project and really around um, the coordination meetings that, that uh, drop in. See, here we were getting on the coordination meetings, but essentially they understood what they were getting at hand over. Now, this, a lot of projects you might have a 3D model for coordination, um, but in this project, the client actually understood what they were getting at hand over. Now, Zootex involved, and um, we've stepped away from the project, but Zootex involved the client to have a 3D model there that can access the information, access. Um, the digital one and safety files. So this is something that would have been new to the HSC and going forward is something they're looking to introduce um, across their projects. Um, so look, we'll take the um, questions and answers now at the round table discussion.